Welcome, lords and ladies, back to the realm. I am your host, the Goat King, and today we begin our explorations of the plains in the Pathfinder setting. But this will be a long journey that will require a primer on planar mechanics and an overview of the planar landscape. The planes are broadly described with a variety of traits. These come in five major categories. Scope traits describe the size of a plane. Most are immeasurable. They are either infinite or close enough to infinite to make the distinction meaningless. If a plane doesn't have a scope trait, you should always assume it is immeasurable. Finite planes have a defined size and boundary as opposed to unbounded planes, which have a defined size, but no boundary. Instead, they loop back on themselves like an old video game. Gravity traits describe how gravity works on the different planes. The normal gravity trait means gravity acts on and is created by mass. In planes with normal gravity, massive objects like planets are needed for any meaningful amount of gravity. Subjective gravity is the second most common gravity trait, or the only one actually being used other than normal gravity. On subjective gravity planes, unattended items and mindless creatures float as if in microgravity. Any creature with a mind can choose a specific direction to be down, allowing them to walk across any surface they choose, as well as fly. High gravity is predictably tough on any creature acclimated to normal gravity. The bulk of all creatures and objects is doubled. Speed, as well as jump height and distance, are halved for creatures used to normal gravity. Physical ranged attacks can't be made past the third range increment. Finally, falling creatures take bludgeoning damage equal to the distance in feet that they fell. Low gravity predictably swings the other way. The bulk of all creatures and objects is halved. Creatures acclimated to normal gravity can jump twice as high and far. Physical ranged attacks can be made out to the twelfth range increment. Finally, falling creatures do not take any damage for the first ten feet of a fall, and they only take an amount of bludgeoning damage equal to a quarter the remaining distance. Microgravity means floating. Lots of it and very little actually going anywhere unless you have something to push off of or an appropriate method of flight. Strange gravity sees all masses attracting smaller objects with roughly the same force. This allows for Super Mario Galaxy-like environments. And if gravity can act without regard for logical reasoning, so can time. The normal flow of time is that of the universe and the majority of other planes. Erratic time is the most frustrating. With such planes, you only know the extent of your loss when you leave. You could lose days or years, but if you're lucky, time might have passed at a normal rate. Flowing time is at least consistent. Even if a particular flowing plane has a punishing speed, you can still be prepared. On flowing planes, time consistently moves either slower or faster than the normal rate depending on the specific plane. Timeless planes are only timeless in that the normal consequences of time do not occur. No hunger, sleep, aging, or even natural healing. One can remain indefinitely, but the longer you stay, the more dangerous it is to leave. Time has a habit of catching up with you. As we continue to laugh at natural laws, let's cover the morphic traits. As usual, there is a normal morphic trait. On morphically normal planes, objects obey the physical and magical laws of nature. Creatures can exert effort and work to change the world around them, like digging a hole or building a wall. Metamorphic planes, however, hold to no such reasoning. They can change at random or even on the whim of a powerful entity's mere thoughts. Sentient planes literally have a mind of their own, changing as they wish it. Static planes put visitors at a distinct disadvantage. Visitors are unable to affect the residents of a static plane or the objects carried by those residents. The only traits left to cover are the essence traits, but we will skip those for now. They belong to specific planes, and we'll talk about them in later videos when we zoom in on those planes. The universe sits at the very core of everything. 
It's overlapped by the transitive planes of the first world, a first attempt at creating the universe now abandoned by the gods, and the netherworld, a distorted and degraded mirror or shadow of the universe. These transitive planes sit close to creation's forge and the void, polar opposites that provide the universe with vital and void energies. Surrounding this stack are the planes of air, wood, water, metal, earth, and fire. This forms a four-dimensional onion, and overlapping all of this is the transitive ethereal plane. All of this makes up the inner sphere, the source of mortal souls and the cycle of quintessence, the fuel and substance of reality. The transitive planes, the first world, the void, and the ethereal plane, while parts of the inner sphere, are categorized separately for their overlapping nature and how they enable, or at least ease, travel. Yet another transitive plane exists, the astral plane, which overlaps the outer sphere. The river of souls flows through the astral toward the boneyard. The planes of the outer sphere were once primarily differentiated by their placement on the alignment chart. This categorization system has fallen out of favor, forcing a more in-depth examination of these planes. The maelstrom makes up the majority of the outer sphere. It is a seething fluid of quintessence from which the other outer planes emerged, and into which they may one day be subsumed. The boneyard rises as a spire from the city of Axis. This spire is the first destination of souls. Here they are sorted and sent onto the plane that closest matches their nature, though some never leave. The plane of Axis is entirely composed of an orderly city. In fact, order defines this plane and its denizens. The forces of Axis work to define, categorize, and bring order to the chaotic cosmos. Elysium, however, is a plane unrestricted by order, where Axis derives beauty from precise geometry and meticulously maintained infrastructure. Elysium seeks the natural beauty of ecology. Its denizens value self-fulfillment and self-improvement. Nirvana is also a plane enrobed in natural beauty, only this environ is not so devoid of order. Peace is the core expression of nirvana, and much of the plane is hidden or inaccessible to outsiders who do not seek to maintain that tranquility. From the outside, heaven is most known for its armies who march to fight the wicked. The plane itself is composed of a mountain with seven distinct tiers. To climb the mountain is to undertake a journey of spiritual purification. The final layer, the garden, is empty. No soul, mortal or divine, has ever reached the top. Hell is the natural opposition to heaven. Its nine inverted layers go deep, each with a different evil and a different torment. Unlike heaven, however, the deepest depths of hell are occupied and ruled by none other than Asmodeus. Abaddon is a plain of festering swamps and volcanic wastelands. Crossing this land is the river Styx. The four horsemen of the apocalypse rule over much of Abaddon, and hanging over all of this, casting a perpetual twilight, is a permanent eclipse, the lidded and comatose eye of a god long ago betrayed, the first horseman, the blood prince. Last of the outer planes, and possibly not of this reality at all, we find the outer rifts. Within the rifts, there are as many distinct regions of suffering as there are souls to suffer within them. The only rule of the rifts is strength. Without strength, one is quickly destroyed and consumed by the stronger denizens of the plane. That is all the planes, but we aren't quite done. There is another category that breaks the rules of planar travel. Dimensions overlay all planes, but they aren't transitive planes. They are infinite, but not exactly spatial. And while there are many dimensions proposed by various planar scholars, 
there are only two which are universally agreed upon. The dimension of time has erratic time and static morphology. It is almost impossible to access, and most who do never come back. Those who do come back have experiences that hint at the possibility of changing one's past. Except for the many ways the dimension and its denizens prohibit such tampering. The dreamlands are a dimension both created and sustained by dreams. There is a permanent deep dream sea and a foam of smaller temporary dreamscapes. Like the dimension of time, travel to and from these dreamscapes requires rare and specialized rituals. That concludes our quick overview of the planes. In future videos, we will go in-depth on each of the elemental planes, and later we will cover the outer sphere in more detail as well. Thank you again for visiting the realm. I have been your travel guide, the Goat King, and as always, travel with loyal companions.